are entering into our second week or message in our series on Joseph. And we are looking this summer at Joseph. And for 11 weeks, we're going to be looking at his story. And it is a wonderful story. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to uh, pick up your Bible, turn to the first book, Genesis, and begin to read the story of Joseph as we are going through this together. Today, we're going to be looking at Joseph, uh, Genesis 39. But I want to uh, recap a little bit of where we were last week. Last week, we saw that Joseph's family, and we talked about the fact that when we meet someone's family, we begin to see and understand who they are and why they are the way they are. And we recognize that every family can be so different. And we saw that Joseph grew up in a family where his father was dysfunctionally passive. There were all these situations where he would be called to give leadership, and he was either passive or at, le- at any rate abdicated from his responsibility as the father and the head of the household. Not only that, but that J- uh, Jacob put his family in jeopardy when he settled in the s- near the site or in the site of the town of Shechem. And the reason that he did that was because he was prioritizing wealth rather than the safety of his family. We also got to meet and see uh, Joseph's brothers. And we saw that they were deceitful, that they were jealous, that they were filled with rage, and that one of them also was filled with lust. And so... From this dysfunctional father and brothers and families comes our main character, Joseph. But the amazing thing we saw was that through all of that, and this is what we talked about, the mind-blowing reality of God, is that even through these sinful circumstances, God accomplished his purpose. Even through sinful circumstances, God accomplished his purposes. And that the providence of God not only works in the good things, but in the broken realities as well. And it's easy for us to understand that because we recognize that God works and moves through us. And we, you and I, each of us, are broken and sinful in different ways. And yet, God uses us to accomplish his purposes. And so we saw how that played out in Joseph's life. We saw how his father favored him. And uh, I want to talk to you just for a second about the proverbial coat of many colors. And the interesting thing about the coat of many colors is that that's not actually what the Bible text says. Uh, what it says is that he wore a coat that went down to his palms. And so what this was, was a very fine linen, uh, would be similar to today of a tailored suit. So Joseph's father gave Joseph a tailored suit. Now, what we want to recognize is that Joseph's family was a family of farmers and herders. And his brothers, and we see this in the future texts, they were out and they were caring for the sheep, and they were nomads, wandering through the land, allowing the sheep to graze wherever they went. But Joseph was back home in his custom-tailored suit when his father sends him out. And when he gets out there, his brothers, filled with rage and jealousy, decide that they want to kill him. Instead, what ends up happening is that they sell him as a slave. And we pick up our story in Genesis 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From that time, he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned. 
the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by the cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought here to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but when I screamed, when he, but I screamed, when he heard my scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. First thing I want us to see about this text, that is the consistent theme and the number of times that the text refers to the fact that even though Joseph was going through all of these trials and these difficulties, that the Lord was with Joseph. In verse 2, the text says, the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3, Master saw that the Lord was with him. Verse 3 again, the Lord gave his success in everything he did. Verse 5, the Lord blessed the household. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And then in verse 21, Joseph is entered into the prison. We're reminded and told again, the Lord was with him. Verse 23, the Lord was with Joseph. I think the providence of God is the theme that carries through the story and the life of Joseph. And it's important for us to see that even in the biblical times, people were treated unjustly. And when we are treated unjustly, what do we need to be reminded of? That simple fact that the Lord is with us. And it raises a question for me as I look at this story. I'm asking, how did Joseph know that the Lord was with him? Because just this is one of the remarkable things about Joseph is, uh, to the best of my awareness, there are only three characters or people throughout Scripture of whom no sin is recorded. Now, the one we should know is Jesus. Another one is Daniel. And the third person is Joseph. And we don't get insight into Joseph's mind or what he was thinking or feeling. He acts with integrity. And I believe that that's so important 
that, that character strength that Joseph is given of acting with integrity is going to hold him fast. Also, with that integrity, he trusted God. In everything he experienced, he continued to trust God. From being thrown in a pit, to being sold as a slave, to becoming trusted as a slave, to being thrown into prison, and as our story continues, we'll, we'll see just how God weaves a story in front of Joseph that is just magnificent. And today, though, the specific area we're going to see the strength of Joseph's integrity, of his character, and of his trusting God is in sexual temptation. Now, in case of those who, of though, in case of, for those of you who are listening and you think, well, sexual temptation isn't an area that you struggle, I want to share with you what Charles Swindle, uh, in his commentary on Joseph, says about temptation. There is not a person who has cast his shadow across this earth, including Jesus Christ, who has not faced temptation. And there is not a single person who has ever lived except Christ who has not yielded it to it at one time or another and suffered the consequences. Temptation is an inevitable part of our fallen world. We cannot escape it. Temptation also wears many faces. There is, for example, material temptation, which is the lust for things. It might be as big as a house or as small as a ring. It might be as bright and as dazzling as a brand new Porsche or as dull and as dusty as an antique top roll desk. Yet, who hasn't felt the burning passion of lust for things? And who hasn't at times yielded to it unwisely? Then there's what we call personal temptation, which is the lust for fame, for authority, for power or control over others. It might be as simple as lust for a title like CEO or president or doctor or professor or admiral. There's nothing wrong with these titles or these positions until lust comes and says, you deserve that for what it will mean to you. Finally, there is sensual temptation, which is lust for another person, or in reality, lust for the person's body. I'm referring here to the hedonistic desire to have and enjoy that which is not one's own, either legally or morally. So, wants to be able to see that even though we're specifically talking about sexual lust and temptation, that that principle of that heart's desire. Lust is really understood as, as our heart, a good desire gone a negative way. And so we're going to look first at Potiphar's wife, and then we're going to look at Joseph, and then we'll look at the response of Potiphar's husband. Potiphar's wife. First thing I want us to notice is that the narrator does not honor her with a memorial of her name. She's simply known as Potiphar's wife. And what does she do? Verse 6 and 7 says, Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph. And we look at that literal, what does that literally mean, those verses in the Hebrew language? It said that Joseph was beautiful in form. He had a good body. He worked physically, and he was beautiful in form or in shape. Second, it says that he was beautiful in appearance or what is seen. So he had a beautiful body, and he had a beautiful face. And then it says, uh, we read it, it says his wife, master's wife took notice of Joseph. But really what it is is she lifted up her eyes to him. And that's kind of an expression that means we, we lift our eyes up to, and, and we think about Psalm 121, lift my eyes up to the hills. It's not just that we're looking at something, but what we're doing is we're reflecting on that in our mind. When we lift our eyes up, we're reflecting and meditating and dwelling on something in our mind. So 
Joseph is beautiful in form and beautiful in, in face, and she has been thinking about Joseph. And that's where it starts. She contemplated it in her mind. In fact, Joseph's, Potiphar's wife had already gone to bed with Joseph in her mind. So many times that by the time she says, come to bed with me, she's already done that act. The boldness that it takes to suggest such a thing. In our present culture, day and age, we read that line and it just is like, oh yeah. But in that day and age, for a woman who was married to say that to anyone, let alone a slave, would be unthinkable, inconceivable. And so, in that ancient Middle Eastern culture, to read this story would viscerally upset the readers. I wish that we were not so desensitized that when we would read this, we would be viscerally upset as well. We're going to come back to Potiphar's wife in a moment, but I want us to see Joseph's response. And herein lies something just beautiful and magnificent. Joseph's response gives two reasons. First reason is loyalty to his master. Verse 8 says, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. So Joseph's first response is say, No, this is, he knows it is not right. He knows he is not married to this woman. He knows that his master is, and he says, I, there's, this is just not right. And now his second reason is very interesting. Then he says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Now, we read that line, and it probably didn't stand out to you, but thinking about it, it's like, okay, well, how is sexual sin a sin against God? And in order for us to understand that, we have to start by understanding the Bible's view of sex. And I want to help you see something that up until this message, I hadn't fully seen or grasped. And that is this. The Bible has the most exalted view of sex of any holy book, and I would say of any book, period. Let me say that again. The Bible has the highest, the most exalted view of sex of any book, period. Let me show you. Proverbs 5 begins with warning the student who the right author of Proverbs is teaching to be aware of people like Potiphar's wife. And it says this, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, should your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. The Bible is commanding and is saying, those of you who are married, may you ever be intoxicated. Another word for that is, is, you know, to be thou ravished with her love. To focus all our desires on the gift that God has given us in our spouses. So we don't lift our eyes up to another we don't look at someone else, but we focus all of our desire and all of our attention on the spouse that God has given us. But it gets even richer than this. In Ephesians 5, we see that sex is a sign of the absolute joy and ecstasy of complete union with God. 
You see, what we forget is that God designed sex. And sex is a good and a beautiful thing. And Ephesians 5 says that sex is a sign of the absolute joy and ecstasy of complete union with God. Let me read it to you. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. Then it says this is a profound mystery. And then Paul says this, but I am talking about Christ and the church. You see that union and that intimacy, that joy that we experience is what God has designed and what God wants for us in relationship with him. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul talks about two becoming one and says, don't unite yourself with a prostitute or anyone who is not your wife because the two become one. Uh, Timothy Keller in his sermon on this text talks about the following. He talks about the fact that when you are sexually intimate with someone, you are naked and you are absolutely vulnerable. There is no other posture where you are more defenseless than being completely naked before another person. Not only that, is that you become one. And the physical union in God's design is supposed to be a sign of the union in every other realm, emotional, mental, social, and spiritual. And that, those, that union in God's design only takes place within a marriage. And so, do you see that the absolutely high view and exalted view of sex that the Bible has. And is it any wonder that our culture has worked so pervasively to utterly destroy it? So let's go back to Potiphar's wife. She doesn't want any of this exalted view of sex. It is not the union of her marriage that she is looking, but what she has is lust. And lust is that desire that has turned inward focused and says it's about me. It is that desire that takes something beautiful that God has created it and it turns it 180 degrees and it makes it self-serving. You see, let me give you some... Uh, comparison here lust is about me but love is about the other person your spouse lust does not care about the other person but love cares only for the other person lust is desiring pleasure regardless of the person but love wants a person regardless of the pleasure lust turns sex into an end itself and love says sex is a way of serving and pleasuring someone else. And the end of lust is death. The end of love is life. Now, I want to prove this last point to you. And the end of lust is death, and the end of love is life. What does Potiphar's wife do when Joseph flees and runs out? and she recognizes she can't have him. At that moment, her lust, that selfish desire, but what she thought was a desire for another person, but is really just a desire for self-satisfaction, that lust rears its true colors and turns to rage, and in fact, it turns to a murderous rage. When Potiphar's wife calls the servants and says, look at what he has done. He tried to rape me. What she is doing is initiating a death sentence for Joseph. Any slave that was accused of doing such a thing would be put to death. And so here she goes from so desperately desiring someone to murdering him. There's another fascinating story in the Bible where this plays out. In 2 Samuel 13, Ammon, the son of David, starts developing lust for his sister or his stepsister. 
And in first Samuel, second Samuel 13, we read, Ammon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Samuel, Absalom, son of David. Ammon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. You see what happened? His mind, he lifted up his eyes and he focused on his sexual desire of being with this person. And she was a virgin and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. And then the story goes on and talks about how he creates a situation where she can be deceived and in that situation then, he is able to fulfill his lustful desires and he rapes his sister. And then, though, afterwards, listen to what the scripture says. After he refused to listen to her and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. And then, verse 15, then Ammon hated her with intense hatred. Lust. The selfish, self-seeking desire of lust always, always destroys. Potiphar. This is what happens when Potiphar hears. When his master heard this story, his wife told them, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, I want to show you something interesting. The anger that Potiphar burned with wasn't towards Joseph. Because if it was towards Joseph, he would have had him executed. The anger that Potiphar was experiencing was towards his wife. He would have understood and known what was really happening. And we know that because he takes Joseph and rather than killing him, he puts him in the king's prison. Well, the king's prison is basically the minimum security or the country club of prisons. It's where political prisoners were kept, not people or slaves who were accused of rape. And so Potiphar is angry at his wife, He's angry because he's losing such a valuable worker, such a valuable servant and a trustworthy slave. But what he does is to take action that is as minimal as possible and still retains the family's honor. And yet through all of this, we're watching from our perspective and we see that God is still in charge. Joseph continues to maintain his integrity. He doesn't say anything ill about God. He understands and believes that God has a reason, that God has a plan. Even though he has been unjustly accused and unjustly punished, he continues to hold on to God's plan. And I want to read with you again that question and answer 27. What do you understand by the providence of God? The almighty and ever-present power of God by which God upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that lafe and bleed, blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty. All things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. What was happening to Joseph was not by chance, but by, was by God's fatherly hand. In closing, I want to share with you a quote from a source other than the Bible. George Leonard was a proponent of sexual liberation and was the editor of Look magazine in the 80s. Later in life, he authored a book called The End of Sex, Erotic Love After the Sexual Revolution. And in it, he says this, I have finally come to see that every game has a rule and sex has rules. Unless you play by the rules, you'll find 
Sex can create a depth of loneliness that nothing else can. I know that there are many who are listening to this who want to make up their own rules when it comes to sexual morality and behavior. And I know that many are indulging not in love, but in lust. And we started by seeing the phrase that the Lord was with Joseph. And why was the Lord with Joseph? Why? Because Joseph had integrity and Joseph trusted the Lord. And he desired to do things God's way. And he desired to not sin against Joseph. When Joseph was faced with temptation, verse 10, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. The temptation starts within our mind. And we need to train our minds to focus on the truth that God has given us. And then we need to refuse and we need to flee from sin. Finally, we can all recognize that the longing for intimacy that we chase will not be found in trying to uh, satisfy our sexual desires, but our longing for that intimacy and our ultimate desire for being so unified with another person in relationship is only truly met with our Heavenly Father who created us through Jesus Christ. And it's possible because, like Joseph, Jesus Christ was falsely accused. But unlike Joseph, he wasn't just sent into a political prisoner or the king's prison, but he died. He paid the penalty of the sin and disobedience that was not his, but was yours and mine. And when that reality enters into our hearts, then it transforms our lives. And the Lord gives us the Holy Spirit that reshapes our hearts so our hearts can be like Joseph's. Our hearts can have the integrity and the trust in God's plan even when unjust or wrong things happen to us. We can continue to trust in God. And so my hope and my prayer is this day that the Spirit, if necessary, has convicted you that the path you are walking on will not honor God, will not help you, and will not honor others, and that you will turn to walk fully in the path that the Lord and the design that the Lord has given, trusting Him. Join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word, which speaks so prolifically to this important issue. And it is so easy for us to be distracted or to buy into lies about sexual morality or behavior. And this day, Lord, we come to you and we confess for the areas where we have been disobedient and we ask that through your spirit you would help us to see and to think about sex and about intimacy in the way you have designed it to be. Ultimately, Lord Jesus, may we recognize that it is our desire to be with the one who created us that is stronger than anything else. And so, Lord, may we feel that intimacy as Ephesians 5 says. A great mystery, but this is the way that you have designed for us to be in Christ as one. And so, Lord, fill us with that truth and that mystery and that reality. In your name we pray, amen.